In a recent video, I showed how to rough out a hatchet handle from Greenwood, like this honey locust, using only hand tools. In that video, I started with a, a fresh split billet like, like this, and using a hatchet, draw knife, and spoke shape primarily, and I guess splitting wedges and a, and a hammer, I got down to this point. Now this blank has to dry before I can hang a head on it. What I'm doing today is showing how to go ahead and hang a head, but I'm going to, have, going to have to substitute something that is dry. So this is also honey locust, but this has been on my shelf since uh, 2018. So it's plenty dry to, to hang a head. I've selected a nice old rusty chunk of steel like this from my, my many options, primarily because for this particular blank, I'm a little bit limited. Working with green wood when you're splitting it, uh, you get what you get and sometimes there may be bug activity you have to trim away or some squirrely grain you want to avoid so I'm a little I'm a slightly smaller than I'd like to be in this dimension right here and that means I had to find an axe head that had a fairly small a fairly short eye length this is the head that fits the bill for that this is a full-size filling axe I just weighed it it weighs three pounds ten ounces and that's way too heavy for most people to be able to swing one-handed so i'm going to do a pretty heavy modification of this mainly to remove material but it'll end up sexying up the axe head a fair bit as well with some curves and uh, i think it'll come out looking great but i make tools for work so this is something like what the endpoint should come out to be this is also honey locust i don't make tools to be fancy or pretty wall hangers they are to do work primarily so that will that will rule the day as far as I go. I'm not going to do any sort of modification that's that's just for looks or or all show and no go. I feel like making this handle round or ovalized rather than octagonal. Shave horse, of course, lets you work really quickly because you can constantly change your angle of approach without having to screw and unscrew a vise.
feels good. This is starting to feel pretty good in the hand now, but I don't do any final tweaks until I have a head on it and I get it out in the yard and can test it because in use, your hands are going to move all up and down this and you don't necessarily feel little ridges and things that are out of place and need to be scraped down until you do that do use it. So it's time to start working on the head. Before I start fitting the head to the handle, I do have to modify the bottom of the eye. However, I'm going to do that because that will affect how the fit goes on. Looking at this particular head, I'm going to do something that I have done several times previously, which is to mount the head upside down. That's because with this, there's some wear up here at the toe, and I'd either have to grind a bunch of material back like this to put a better profile to the bit. That's a little exaggerated, something like, like that. Or I can flip the head upside down, and there's a bit more material up there. I'll have a little bit of an upswept toe, um, and I then really am only taking off a relief for for fingers, and I'm just approximating what I will do. I need to take off about a pound or a little over a pound of steel. So it's gonna kind of look like an oversized carving ax. Maybe I'll sweep this in a little bit and sweep that down a little as well. I'm going to take off whatever chunks I can with a portable bandsaw that I have a little platen for. It's right over here. I clamp it in my vise. Nothing fancy. And then there will be quite a bit of cleanup with a belt grinder and an angle grinder. So that's as much as I'm going to do with the bandsaw. It just gets the worst of the bulk out of there. And I'm just going to put some, hopefully somewhat pleasing looking curves in there by eyeball. But uh, I don't want any hard corners because that can cause stress risers, that kind of thing. Also, there's just uncomfortable when your finger's up in there. That's honestly, it's a bigger issue.
This is a rough ground. I haven't wire wheeled it to clean it up or anything. Honestly, I don't like this point right here. The few of these that I've made that have this point, although they, people seem to like the look of that, this point will dig into the wood as it's driven on. I made a bad cut with the bandsaw is what happened. I was trying to steer it more this way. Another note is grind geometry. Notice there's no significant convex in this region here. I still have not, not a millimeter, but there's a little bit of a bluntness to it. It's not going to cut anybody. I could take this out in the yard right now, slap this on a handle. It would do work as is because of its overall geometry. It's expedient to use a slack belt and just do the minimum amount of work, take off the least amount of material, get an edge razor sharp. Is that a working axe? No. A working axe, especially an all-rounder like this one will be, this one will split nicely, it will chop nicely, it will hew. And that's owing to its overall geometry. Uh, a fairly flat, overall wedged profile. If there's any significant sort of convex, especially right up near the edge, it's a, it's a performance destroyer. And that's actually an easy visual cue to someone who doesn't really know what they're doing restoring axes if you see a real convex grind just right at the edge. I'm almost ready to start fitting it on the handle, but there's one critical, crucial step that must be done first. Focus on right here, this hard corner, this actual inward curling burr right there. That should always be radiused, given a smooth chamfer. Here's what happens if that's not done. This is a Snow and Neely premium axe. And somebody brought this to me at a market and they said within three swings of new, the head broke off. And here's exactly why. That inward curling burr severs the wood fibers and creates a massive weak point right there. I use a, you can use a rat tail file, it takes a while. I use a die grinder with this little flame shaped, double cut rotary carbide burr, rotary file, whatever it's called. And I'm gonna work that until there's a very smooth radius shoulder all the way around. And when I fit axes, there is not a single curl of wood coming up. So here's another even more extreme example. If you don't take that burr off, when you start fitting the ax head, it's like a cookie cutter just cutting its way on. You don't want that. You, so an ax head in cross section should look like a bow tie or an hourglass, and it should wedge on to the bottom, and you drive a wedge in from the top. So the, here's a great example of one. This is a Stanley. It's, you know, it's a name brand of uh, the head cut its way on like a cookie cutter, made this massive shelf down here, major weak point, and you have Snap City. By radiusing, smoothly chamfering the bottom of the eye, when I do my, my test fitting, there will be probably a single curl of wood raising up. It will just be smooshing its way on as I do my test fits. It'll be co completely clean as driven in the end, no trimming. That's typical for my installs.
So only now that I have a very smooth radius chamfer all the way around the bottom of the axi can I start doing the fitting. And I'm just going to eyeball to the best of my ability. I'm using my fingers to kind of pinch it, pinch it to center here. And I'm just eyeballing center and trace the eye on the top like that. Here's my tracing. I do like to put the front of the eye right at the front of the handle and have any excess toward the rear. So that looks pretty good. Most axes I build, the tracing of the eye is the singular pencil mark I ever make on the piece of wood. Because I'm starting with irregular stock most of the time, it's a matter of eyeball. You're eyeballing it straight, and you're taking material off to make your blank. You just preferentially remove material, but this, this is a crucial guideline right here, the tracing of the eye. I'm going to do the rough establishment of that with the draw knife and then refine it with a spoke shave, rasps, scrapers, etc. And that's all done for me on the shave horse. I need to cut down to the line, but it needs to be very gradual from about yay far back. Close one. Very close. shot a little bit at the top but that's why I gave myself plenty of extra length in the eye there so Let's see where my friction marks are just by pressing initially yep. here here I use the spoke shave for a lot of this initial fitting. test fit where we drive that on a little bit with a mallet.
Here are the friction marks from the first real test fit where I used a couple of mallet blows to drive it on there. A little bit of a compression line here, a little bit here, but no curls forming. And that's because I deburred the bottom of the eye, but I am getting fairly uniform for the very first test fit friction marks all around. And as this goes on, that's what I'm going to aim to maximize is these the, the discolored areas, which is where the dirt from the inside of the axe eye is rubbing off on the wood here. I want the most of that possible. Here's what it looks like at the bottom of the eye on the second test fit. Not a single curl forming because I deburred the bottom of the eye properly. that dead nuts. Significant element of luck in that. Didn't have to do any adjusting on this one. gaps at the bottom perfectly straight a little bit of protrusion through the top I think I need to do one more test fit so this is probably the last test fit but I'm within the last two or three so I switched from the spoke shave to a rasp a rasp makes a rougher surface which will bind better inside the the rough kind of surface corrosion we have going on inside the eye there and i i do a few more mallet strikes too on the last test fit so just one or two This axe is now ready for testing. So there's no top wedge. I haven't even cut the kerf in the top yet, but I'm quite confident in the frictional binding at the bottom of the eye that I can go up and test how it performs in splitting, chopping, hewing, all the various tasks that an axe of this size and style should be competent to do. And if anything is wrong, I can pop the handle off and re-grind without the handle being in the way. I just want to get a good sense that there's good frictional binding at the bottom. The overall grind geometry is acceptable. And uh, I want to feel for any irregularities in the handle before I commit to that permanent installation and everything is more difficult to work on at that point. So I think that will be another video all the final refinements of this axe that's enough to 
delve into a little more deeply with another video. So let's just finish up with the, the satisfaction of getting a little bit of work done with this.